Our gospel today comes from Luke, the 15th chapter. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the gospel of our Lord. I invite you to be seated at this time. So our gospel story today is one of the most well-known stories from the Bible. The story of the prodigal son. Yes, have we heard this before? Okay, it should be fairly familiar. It's a common one. And what tends to happen when we hear this story is to focus on the sons, the one who spent his inheritance and the one who won't, that doesn't want to accept his brother back. But I think oftentimes we overlook the father in this story. So today I want to focus on the father to have a better understanding of what this story reveals to us about God's character. So in this story, there are three main characters, right? We know this. The prodigal son who wastes his inheritance, the frustrated and unforgiving older brother, and the loving father. Now, it's important to recognize who these characters are meant to symbolize. So, the wasteful son represents a sinner who eventually repents and turns back to God. The older brother represents a faithful individual blinded by pride and a sense of entitlement. And the Father represents God. So Jesus tells this story because 
as we heard at the beginning of our text today, some Pharisees and scribes were upset that Jesus was spending time with sinners. So Jesus, after some other parables, there's some parables in between there, uh, tells them this story about two sons and their father. So the context is set up. The religious authority, represented by the older brother, and the sinners, represented by the wasteful son. And it's into this context that Jesus tells this story. Now, we also, we really need to examine this story and think about it um, to really grasp what the father does on behalf of both of his sons. So let's first explore what happens with the prodigal son. So, we heard the prodigal son say to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So this is a really loaded statement, folks, one that needs to be explored. So let's think about this. So the father, we heard about him throughout the story. His father is one who has done well. He has slaves, he has good robes, he has rings, he has wealth, he has livestock, and a fatted calf. It sounds like someone who has land, who has cattle, who has done well in the world. So, what do we know about ranching and farming? In this community, we know quite a bit about that. So, is it a big deal to own land? That's, that's a, is it a big deal to own land? Yeah, of course it is. It's a big deal. So, most of the land here was passed down from one generation to another, right? So, it's inherited land, full of family history, right? We get that. Okay, so this is the same in Jesus' context. The land that was owned was often passed down from family member to family member. So there's a rich family heritage going on with owning land at this time. So owning land and property was important. So we, we, we get this, right? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, good. So now... Imagine with me for just a second that you are a parent who owns land, property, and wealth. And now imagine that you have a son who pretty much tells you, why don't you die already so I can receive my inheritance? What would your reaction be? Probably not what we heard in our story. So it's probably to immediately go to your will and write them out of it, right? I think that's probably the common reaction. Or to say, you're, you're joking, right? You're, you're really joking about this. But that's what we hear in our story today. The son comes to his father and says, give me my inheritance now. And we heard that the father, hearing these words, divides his property between himself and his son. And what his son does with the land and livestock and wealth that he received, what did he do with that? He wasted it. So again, let's think about this. He sold it. He sold the land that had been in his family for who knows how long. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. Can you imagine the rage that one would feel in our community if you gave inheritance to your kid early and the land that's been in your family for 100 years, and they just go and sell it. Your reaction would be what? Anger, disgust. How can you spit on our family heritage like that? Right? Yeah, I think, I think that would be the reaction. This kid spits in his father's face by just going and selling what has been given to him and then squanders it in dissolute living. He goes and lives his life without a care in the world for work, for the future, for anything except pleasure. He spends his inheritance and forsakes his family. This son sold his family's land. He broke his family's traditions with his lifestyle and eventually ends up destitute. 
He finds himself caring for unclean animals, according to the Jewish tradition. He's working at a pig farm. And it's when he hits rock bottom, where he has nowhere else to turn, that he considers going back to the one whose land that he sold, whose traditions that he broke, whose lifestyle he abandoned. He decides to go back to his father to ask to work as a hired hand. So again, put yourself in this father's shoes. Your son asked for his inheritance before you died, essentially telling you to die already. Took that inheritance that you gave when you didn't have to and sold your family's land. He broke your family's traditions. He squandered all that he was given and now he has come crawling back. What would your reaction be? What would the world tell you to do in this situation? The world would say, disown your son if you haven't already. Tell him to go away and you never want to see him again. Rub it in his face that he had plenty when he asked you for his inheritance. Shame him for the shame he has caused you. Right? That would be the world's reaction. Hurt him because he hurt me. Right? This is how the world would demand the Father act. And this is how we are inclined to act as well. And the prodigal son understands this. He assumes that he's already been disowned and is just trying to earn enough to get by as a hired hand. And this is why the son has has resolved to do. He says to himself, I will get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against you And before you in heaven, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. He's got this conversation all rehearsed and ready. He only hopes to find a place to work and have enough to eat. And as we heard, what is the reaction of the father? Forgiveness. Something unheard of. The father sees his son, runs out to him hugs him, and kisses him. Now, we got to remember, this is a reserved society, folks, much like the Scandinavian heritage up here. So, can you imagine this guy, this son who's hurt you so much, pulling into the driveway, can you imagine bursting out of the door, running, hugging, giving him a kiss? Can you imagine doing that? Even if it was a son that really, that he hadn't seen in a long time, that was really good and nice, can you imagine running out and doing that? Maybe not. So this father is the patriarch of this family, the one who is honored and reserved in showing emotion, one who's respected and supposed to act in that way. And yet, he forsakes tradition, runs to his son, hugs him, and kisses him. And then, before his son can get out his rehearsed apology, the father orders his slaves to give his son the best robe they can find, a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet, to kill the fatted calf and begin preparing a celebration. This is unbelievable. How can this father react in such a way when he has been treated so poorly? How can the patriarch of a wealthy family act in such a way to a son who has squandered his entire inheritance? What amazing love and forgiveness is shown here, brothers and sisters. This is our God. When we have hope, And then, we hear about the older brother's reaction. When he finds out about his father's reaction to his younger brother's return, he confronts his father. And this also would not have been acceptable. So, how many of you here, who are farmers and ranchers, who have a father who runs the business, would feel really confident reprimanding him about what he's done? Anybody? Probably not, right? This would not be received well in our society. That a son 
would think they know better and, hey, you shouldn't have done that. What were you thinking? This is unacceptable. It probably wouldn't go over so well, right? And same in this society. This son says to his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. The son is really out of line here. Demanding that his father doesn't love him. That he's worked tirelessly for years and never received what his brother is now receiving. And yet... The father does not respond in anger. His father doesn't reprimand him about trying to put him in his place. The father responds patiently, explaining his actions. He says, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Our parable today demonstrates God's great love for you, brothers and sisters. God's great love for you when your selfishness gets in the way of serving God. When we demand, I want to use what you've given me for my own purposes, not for yours. When we demand our inheritance only to seek after our own pleasure and our own desires. When we use all that God has given to us, ourselves, our time, our possessions, our talent, our money, our property, only for ourselves and for our own selfish longings. God's great love is shown today. For when we repent from our selfishness, and we turn back to God, God celebrates. God rejoices. For we who were once dead are once again alive. We who were once lost have been found. And God's love is shown to us when we look at others and we think they're not as deserving as we are. When we cast judgment on others, seeing them as less worthy than we are of God's love and affection. When we declare others as not good enough, or not worth God's time, or undeserving of God's love and grace, even then, God lovingly teaches us that we should also rejoice in our brothers and sisters coming to repentance. Something interesting about our text today is that the two brothers are both focused solely on themselves. The younger brother is consumed by his selfish desires and a sense of entitlement. But this is mine, and I want it now so I can use it for whatever I want. And the older brother is consumed with his pride and his own sense of entitlement. I've been here all along. Don't I deserve something better? This is supposed to be mine also. And yet, the father seems to have none of these characteristics. The father isn't concerned with his pride. He runs and hugs as kisses his son that has forsaken him. He allows his oldest son to berate him and rage at him while he calmly explains the reason for celebrating. God is not motivated by God's pride, as we often are. God is not motivated by selfishness, as we often are. God is motivated by love, brothers and sisters, love for you and love for all people for sinners and the faithful, for those who are selfish and prideful. 
Love is what motivates God. Love is what makes this father run to his younger son. Love is what makes this father patiently bear with the older son. Love is what motivates God. And we hear this in one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son so that those who believe in Him may not perish but may have eternal life. God is motivated by love, brothers and sisters, and loves all people, even the selfish, even the prideful. And by God's love, we are transformed. We are changed. We come face to face with our selfishness and our pride and our greed and our judgment. And we see God's love for us and for others. And we are changed. In this season of Lent, where we are called to repent, to turn back to God, to return to God as the prodigal son did, we are reminded of God's reaction to repentance. God rejoices and God celebrates. God throws a party for we who once were dead have been given life. For we who were lost have been found. For we who were consumed by our pride and selfishness have turned instead to follow God and learn God's ways. As you continue in your Lenten journey, I hope that you will experience God's joy as you repent and turn back to God. Amen.